Princeton, working on a book that's continuing this discussion of education reform that he began in so much reform. And this is tentatively entitled, Fragile Victories, the State of Debate on Urban School Reform. Uh, as I said before, Charles has been part of the Hammer Institute for many, many years. He comes every time. You never know what he's going to say, but it's always wonderful. <laughs> and uh, so what he's going to do today <laughs> is, is introduce wow. us to <laughs> the institutions teaching a movement. And so I am thrilled to, uh, to uh, introduce to you Charles Payne, a wonderful friend of ours at the Hammer Institute. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. And the truth is, I don't exactly know what I'm going to say. I was, I was teasing her, but it's the truth. Then. Uh, I am always glad to come here, uh, partly because I don't get to come to Mississippi enough anymore, uh, partly because Jackson has some of the best fried chicken in this country, um, but partly because I believe in this work. I believe in what, 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 what you're doing. But by virtue of being here, you become a part of the African American tradition of education and collaboration. Right? And uh, even I think, even if obliquely, in my remarks today, uh, I, I think I'll make it clear how important that whole process is to me. The talk I had planned uh, was supposed to be a three act, three, uh, three acts, right? One was going to be what they were alluding to in the uh, uh, previous panel. A discussion about institution building in the African American community and how those institutions created a kind of platform for the civil rights movement, black freedom struggle as we think of it in its modern form. That was to be one. Then I wanted to have some sort of brief discussion uh, in American history. How that should be preserved, or you, however you want to think about it. But then I heard Brother Macklemore a few minutes ago making all of the really positive overstated <laughs> interpretations about the role of the black church in black struggle. Right? Um, I decided sitting over there on the spot, I'm going to take issue with some of that stuff. Right? Now, how coherent this is going to be, I don't know. Right? Um, but the point is that I think in both its historical and contemporary form, the black church is too much better. Right? Or, or, to put it another way, um, um, other streams of struggle are not given as other sources of leadership are not given as much credit as they deserve uh, in these narratives, uh, even in our counter narratives. If you will. Um, um, so, so let me um, get started with that. Um, when we are going to uh, go back to the oldest of educational technologies, a slide chip. <laughs> uh, and I want to, to say right now, some of you are going to say that the quality of some of these slides is not that high. And that's because <laughs> I don't do slides. I have students who do slides. Uh, this week, all my students are taking exams, right? So I actually had to do these daggone things myself. <laughs> and I'm going to sit there and complain about the quality of the slide. You need to be glad you got some slides. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to spend at least 30 minutes, maybe a little bit more, depending on how it goes. And I know that this, this stuff about institution building, as, as Michelle was saying, it's old hack to some of you, some of you know more about some of this than I do. I do think some of it will be new to you, but at least I think it'll help us start off with, 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 with a common set of uh, terms and assumptions. I'm going to start off talking about black colleges. Right? Um, clearly, part of the institutional base for the modern black freedom struggle is the fact that in, in the decade after 1947, you get a one-third increase in the number of students attending uh, black colleges from about 2 million in, in 47 to about 3 million, 3, 3 million plus in 57. It's that explosion. And what's driving that explosion in part? It's the black veterans coming back with GI benefits and they don't have to pay, you know, they, 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 they can pay tuition, including people like Andrew Moore and Medicare. So this is one of the, that's a really iconic photographs in this first set, right? Uh, these are the four Greensboro. Right? 
segregate the lunch counter to desegregate the lunch counter, right? They desegregated the lunch counter because it was an assault on black dignity, right? And when, when you, and, and, and when people look back at the movement and they reduce it to an attempt to desegregate, an attempt to integrate, that does not capture the feelings of many of the people who were involved at the time. It, whether it was integrated or, or, or not is less important than it was constructed socially to insult black people. Right? And that distinction is very obvious. But if you listen to, to February 1 and Franklin McCain's interviews, he just died, I think, last year. Uh, if you listen to his interviews, he is just so eloquent right, about what they were trying to do and just wonderful about the transformative impact that that moment had on him. Right? Uh, uh, everything after that he said was, was, was uh, second. So four boys the first day. 23 kids the second day, and many of them coming from the, the local black women's college, Bennett College, right? By the third day, 60 kids. Fourth day, there were 1,000 kids in, in downtown Greensboro, four days, and then February, February 5th, right? At the end of the first year, 25% of all black colleges had had sit-ins. By the best estimates we have, one in six black students in the South in that period had been arrested during that first year. One in 20 had been killed. Uh, something like 50 to 60 uh, regular, I'm sorry, 50 to 60,000 regular participants, that is, they engaged in more than one. So, in every place, you know, every place was different. Every place had a different kind of style. Every, 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 every uh, city, the Nashville group, Diane Nash, Diane Lewis, right? This legendary name, led, led, led by, by, by James Lawson. They're some of the most serious, the most spiritual, most deeply committed to um, uh, nonviolence. Some of them were actually kind of disappointed when, when Green the Road jumped in, because they had spent the whole year previous to that getting themselves ready to wait that struggle. And the kids from Green the Road just jump out of nowhere, right? And they, <laughs> they do it without that long period of Gandhi and struggle that they had gone through. Um, um, the Atlanta kids were considered the, the, the most middle class. Kids off out of Spelman, Morehouse, uh, Morris Brown, the AU campus. Uh, they were considered the most middle class, the most snobbish uh, kids in the uh, movement, looking down on everybody else. Uh, they looked down on the North Carolina kids as a uh, country. Uh, you know, all, all of these dynamics in the African American community at, at that time. North Carolina kids, on the other hand, threw themselves into activists, right? They were the ones who would get out there and do something while all these other people were talking and philosophizing. So every, every group had its, had its own kind of flavor and or uh, reputation. The, the, the research suggests that in the early waves, who's coming off these campuses, right? Who's participating first in this kind of activism? They are the better students, that is, they get the, 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 the academically better students. And they come from somewhat more privileged families. Now this is a from an African American class structure of the 1950s in the South, almost everybody's first generation, right? Uh, but there, there's still differences in privilege among some of these families. There's upper working class and lower working class. There, there are all kinds of distinctions, right, that, 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 that one can make. Now, after the first year, those kinds of distinctions, so many people involved that you don't see that. But I'm saying that because studies of the of, of Vietnam protests say exactly the same thing, right? That the first anti-Vietnam War protesters are the better students on the better campuses coming from relatively more privileged families. But then after him, after, after uh, a time, so many people are participating that those initial distinctions are just, just uh, washed up. There is in almost every state in the South a narrative about the distinctions between public, which, would you hit one more slide? It's Dory Latin. Uh, where are you doing from? What's, what's the name of the town? Outside of uh, Palmer's Palm Cross. Cross. Yeah. Uh, she and her sister are just iconic figures. She saw me at the end. Yeah, I saw that. I'm so sorry. Anyway, um, there is, there is, there is a, uh, in every state, there is a story to be told about the differences between black public colleges uh, that had to answer for their money to a state legislature that was white supremacist. 
Uh, black, black private colleges that had a little bit more operating to work, right? And the general uh, 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 story is that the private schools were more aggressive in administratively, in organization, in terms of their leadership. Uh, um, were more aggressive, more encouraging of their students' uh, participation. Sometimes they were, they were literally inspired their students to participate. And the public colleges, you know, uh, their public face almost had to be, we're against this stuff, or we're going we're to try to stop it, right? Sometimes underneath the table, those administrators were actually encouraging students that they were condemning in public. Very often, though, very often, uh, the, 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 the black public college of Jackson State, for example, my point is, I was going to say, I had always heard that Jackson State put the Landers sisters out because of their activism. Their, their uh, NWCP youth club, youth uh, group members, then they become SNCC members. They're among the, they, they are participants in the first sit-ins in, in, in Jackson. They're, they're just all over the map, both of registration work. Leslie just corrected me and said they weren't actually expelled, but, 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 but they were, but they were, um, it was clear that they, they weren't going to have a long tenure here, right? And so they did what happened to a lot of time. Kids at public colleges, they're transferred to the more liberal, more progressive uh, private college. In this case, they, 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 they go to Tudor. Would you just say something about how you saw those differences between public and private? Well, I, I was uh, indicating that Charles, Joyce, and Dory, and I were in uh, the high wide and try high wide together in Mississippi. That was the uh, black version of the YMCA and, y and YWCA for college students uh, in the 50s. And so I met I met them uh, then uh, in the high wide and try high wide. And they were also active in the NAACP uh, in, in Hattiesburg, from across them, because Clyde Bernard had organized. Uh, them and of course you read Frank Bernard was you know was the advisor. So I told Charles I was surprised that they elected to come to Jackson State. But you know they were they were probably 17 to 18. Uh, but when I graduated from high school I was 19. And when I went to college I was 20. And in high school I had led a bar kind of my high school uh, in uh, one of the teachers uh, who was a social science person, uh, suggested to me that I probably shouldn't apply to those state schools like uh, Jackson State and Mississippi Valley and all uh, the, the teacher, Reverend Burton, said to me, Michael Moore, you wouldn't last a day. So, <laughs> so, but I was older and I understood that uh, Joyce and Dory were, were younger, but they actually were involved as freshmen in, in protest activity, but really the, the big issue with them in, in March of 1961, the Tougaloo Nine uh, tried to integrate the public library here in, in Jackson. And Dory and Joyce organized uh, support uh, from the students here at Jackson State. So they organized students to go downtown to protest the arrest of the Tougaloo Nine. And obviously they had been in have been involved in some activities prior to that, but, but that Tougaloo 9 activity really got them in hot water with the administration. And that was a guy who was the president here called Reddix. And, and Reddix made it very clear, as you point out, uh, that they wouldn't be welcome upon returning their sophomore year, so that's why they went to Tougaloo. But they were very much active in organizing uh, student activity. But, but I knew then, that you shouldn't go to a state supported school because they had presidents who were tyrants. And this guy was a tyrant. The guy at Mississippi Valley was a tyrant, President White. The guy at All Corn, President Board, was a tyrant. So they had reputations to protect. And absolutely, if you wanted to protest, if you wanted to you know, be a student uh, at those schools, you, you just you really shouldn't come. But, but there are some weird things about that as, as, you, as you talk about it because uh, when, I, when, I, when I first made my first road trip from Bob Moses to Atlanta to the, uh, my first SNCC meeting in 1962, I was in the car with Bob Moses, Jimmy Travis, and the president of the Student Body Association here at Jackson State. 
he was in the car. So they had been organized. Bob Holmes and his big people had been organized. And of course, Med Gerber's office was right down the street. So Joyce and Dory had been dropping in. And mm -hmm. you know, Medgar had been organizing. But so you know, you had the real contradictions. The president was against it. But on the other hand, you had students in spite of that. And then the guy who was the president before, who actually uh, a recently retired judge in Chicago, was president of student government here. He had been expelled from, from the school. And just two years ago, we managed to get him his diploma from Jackson State. He wow. finally graduated. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. I, I, I want to focus on, the, on this notion of contradictions, right? Because that, that, for me, is something that I would like to think about as you run through all of these institutions. Part of my point is that none of these are progressive institutions inherently. None of them are inherently conservative. They both have both of these potentials here, right? So that no matter how conservative the administration is, black college campuses serve as an incubator of racial conflict. You cannot bring young black people together in, in, in numbers and have them talking about social and historical issues without some of that turning to our situation and what can we do about our situation for some kids. You read Stoke, Stokely Kwame Ture's uh, characterization of Howard uh, when, when he goes there, uh, I think he ended in 59. And, and it's basically, this is a bunch of bourgeois, where's the next party kind of kids. And so I'm saying that that's there among the kids as well as the administration at the same time. There's also this potential for producing, in the case of, 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 of Howard, the NAG group, all of those young activists who will wind up being, being many of them here in Mississippi a couple of years later. Both of those kind of dynamics are present simultaneously, right? At any one point in time, this part can be stronger or that part can be stronger. Whichever is dominant is going to change over time, right? But it's the contradictory elements that I, that I want to, uh, and the institutions that you and, and some of the people. And, and to go back to Tugelu. One of the other things. Uh, okay, even well, you can't get good help with me. <laughs> uh, John Salter is a Tougaloo faculty member and advisor to the Tougaloo uh, NAACP chapter. Uh, the white woman next to him, the Joan Trumpower, she was an exchange student uh, from Duke studying that year, I think, at, at Tougaloo. And that's Anna Moody next, next to her. Looks like somebody's pulled something yep. into, into her hair. This is a, a sit-in in downtown Jackson, I'm just trying to make the point that again, here you have faculty members at, at Tougaloo, right, who are going out with their kids, right? Uh, one of the other ones that almost everybody, the, the Latin sisters, uh, Lawrence Diak is one of the great spirits of Sassoonian uh, speaking with, with just devotion and, and, and deep, deep appreciation for what they got from Ernst Gorinsky. Uh, a member of the sociology department there who was a part of that generation of Jewish academics who fled the Holocaust and wound up teaching in black colleges someplace in the South and were particularly inspirational uh, in the way in which they connected their history with the struggle of African Americans. But it's simply to say that, that, that people like that could find a space in the black college campuses that was very, very, very difficult to find on black uh, so in a lot of ways, the point I'm going to make next week, uh, these are really high school, probably a mistake, just go to the next week. Hardly a more iconic battle in Birmingham, right? There, there is no, um, no campaign in all of the civil rights history that is supposed to develop, that it illustrate the role of the church, church based mobilization of a, of a community, uh, that Birmingham. And what I, want, what I want to say is all that stuff is true, but <laughs> it's true for the 18% of the black churches in Birmingham which ever participated in any way. I said 18%. That's one in five, right? I would really clear, I think, that something like the majority of the black ministers in Birmingham did not want King to come. And if, and if, and if they could have had their choice, they would have run Shellsworth, who was the, the Reverend Shellsworth who is a kind of black minister that Leslie was talking about, right? Um, he represents that tradition of really deep, courageous ministerial activism, but he was not representative of the black ministry of Birmingham, right? 
Although in retrospect, people look back and say, oh, that, that, that's a trickly moment, right? Most of the churches in Birmingham were against it. And if, and if you had been talking about someplace in rural Alabama, the proportion of churches that would have been anti-movement in the very early years would have been larger, right? It would have been larger, right? When, 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 when you go to places where you lose the protection of large congregations in big cities, uh, where, where violence is much more in your face, the church as institution, right? That's all. Right? Now, there's all kinds of all kind of things go into that sense. But but I had partly, and in general, as as blacks urbanize, churches become larger. They have more money. It's just a different level of, of, of capacity. These Michelle, these next several slides, you can just go through two or three. They're just to, to remind you what the Birmingham demonstrations were like. You reach a point where there ain't that many adults, black adults, who are supportive of the movement, right? Mm -hmm. And you reach a point where all the black adults who are willing to go to jail are in jail. While King is out of town, some of his lieutenants, primarily uh, uh, Reverend Bevel, make the decision that King would probably not have supported as he's been in town to allow the children who are champion at the bits to demonstrate and go to jail to allow them to go. Right? And of course, from there, the Birmingham movement goes up another level. This next picture, if you haven't seen it, and I'm sorry that it's not clear, but this young woman's face. Or if I had been in charge of white supremacy back in the day, <laughs> I would have seen that woman's face and I would have packed my bags. I mean, she, it, it, it's just dead. When young black people have that attitude of disdain toward a cop who come with it, and, 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 and you know, that he knows the camera's on him, and he wants to beat those kids down. You know he does, right? Can't right? but, I mean, that, 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 but, but that picture for me captures captures a kind of change in, 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 in who's initiating and who is reacting. The next couple of pictures, I think, so this is um, so many people. They actually did fake build the jail, right? That, that, that movement tactic. And, and so this is the Essex County Fairgrounds uh, girls, and they just like what? They're in charge. <laughs> the next one should be. Brad Shuttlesworth. Right. Uh, who, as I said, he's sort of the icon, the iconic version of the, the Shuttlesworth, the CT Williams. Um, started when the NWCP is made illegal. He started, I believe, in the year 1953, the Alabama Christian Movement for uh, Human Rights, um, and just led a broad based community campaign uh, against segregation in all of its forms. For, his church was bombed three times. His home was bombed once. I think we have the, the home bomb next. And look at that man's expression <laughs> as he stands amid the rubble of his own home. Who knows that the sermon? Some of this is this is some of you might actually know. The name of the sermon he, he, he preached that Sunday was what? God didn't spare me to run. That's right. Oh, man. God didn't spare me to run. That was rough with Hellfire. So this next picture is him leading a group of kids, which probably included his own children. One of his daughters wrote, a, wrote an essay to Timo, which was, growing up as Fred Shuttlesworth's child is not an easy thing. <laughs> 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 uh, and, you know, written with love and humor and all that, right? But you had to be in every administration. And one of these, I'm going to leave kids in the schools, he, he, he had to walk through the mob, and they beat him down with bicycle chains, right? Mm -hmm. uh, his wife was into that. We got the pop and another, and, and another. Uh, yeah, the so, did somebody say that? Got yeah, caught in the car door. Got yeah, caught in the car door. Okay. Uh, and I think there's one more show. This has always been. King goes into Birmingham because Shuttlesworth is there. He goes into Birmingham. He knows Dry Act, some of you. He's been quote, I don't like this victory. Make me defeat language, but whatever. This is the language that was, he had suffered this defeat in Albany, Georgia, uh, with, against Lloyd Pritchard. Lloyd Pritchard, you know, the non violent, publicly non violent. Uh, so you have to have a victory. If you want a victory, you go find a place where you have a whole con. You know. uh, but you also need a place where you have, and, uh, you have movement infrastructure on the ground. 
right? And by this time, Fred Shellsworth had this absolutely disciplined army of people. It was small, but it was disciplined, and they do anything that Fred said, right? So part of the reason he chooses Birmingham is that over a, a, a decade, right, Fred Shuttlesworth has built up this army of nonviolent protesters, right, that you would not have had had he gone anyplace else. So part of what happened, right, is even on the day that the announcement was made and the movement decided, well, Fred, you have been doing this for a decade, when they were going to announce the, 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 the victory about desegregating stores in downtown Birmingham. Uh, Fred was supposed to read the announcement, and uh, uh, he did. The assembled press ignored him, and then they took his announcement, took what Shelter had read, gave it to Dr. King, and said, now would you read it, and then the cameras click off, right? <laughs> and what the world sees is Dr. King announcing the Birmingham victory. What the Birmingham movement had wanted to say is this was the struggle and the handiwork and the fruit of a decade of a man's struggle. Right? That, that's not the message to go. I'm just saying with the show. That, that's the master narrative, right? The master narrative is, is inherently elitist, and it privileges the contributions of higher status people over lower status people. Right? And so that's, that's a part of what's, what's tragic. Oh, and by the way, when, 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 when Reverend Shellsworth died, the New York Times, as it so often does, it's beginning to get out of this habit now. The first version of their obituary was started off by something like, Fred Shuttlesworth who marched with Dr. King. Uh, <laughs> I mean, his whole history, right? Much of which is earlier than Dr. King's activist history, right? It just obliterated. But somebody got on them, because then they, that was taken down, and they put up a much more reasonable and respectful, uh, respectful. But the point I wanted to make is, is again, a, 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 a point about the dual character of the black church. There is this potential there, right? There's also this conservative side there, right? The, um, in the uh, rural side, where you had more danger, is where the church, I mean, I've always been I'm struck when I look at Mississippi County by two things. By the fact that up in the Delta, there is no county that, where, where the churches as a group in the early 60s, just sort of step up and say, wait, pull this thing, right? But there's also no county where I can't find one church that did. It's not always like there's just one minister who says, this is what the Lord wants, right? It's undeniable. I'm going to stick me and my little congregation out there. So it's never, it's never one or the other, right? But in Birmingham in the spring of 1963, Bob Moses uh, was writing memos back to the main office saying one of the biggest problems we have are the teachers and the preachers, right? That part of the black middle class, right? Same time, and I suspect Leslie could tell you every doctor <laughs> and dentist that is black in the state of Mississippi in those days, right? It was a small number, but they tended to be quite a lot, right? So you can't say the black middle class is this or that, right? Now, a lot of it has to do with whether you're in the part of the black middle class that is economically independent, right? Or the part of the black middle class, again, that, that draws its dollars from. And, 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 and when you say that too, in a lot of towns, you have independent black businessmen who are running illegal businesses, right? Uh, who are still stalwart supporters of the movement because they don't even doggone what the white folks, right? But that's not where their that's not where their money comes from. But to go back to the church, Dick Gregory, uh, Greenwood, April '63. It is disgraceful in this area that the Negro League religious leaders haven't played their part. Not at all. I'm a Baptist by choice. But if I had to spend much time in this area, they'd have to force me to be a Baptist. Because even little kids are in this program. Not one Baptist church has opened up its doors in this area. Loud and sustained applause. Now, suppose you're a minister, and you're sitting here, right? And the church, the most respected institution in the black community, is being insulted by Dick Gregory, and the black community is right there with him. Right? In college, I almost decided to be a school teacher. But when I see how far behind school teachers in this area are dragging their feet, I'm glad I didn't decide. A lot of applause. And your principal you have here, this guy, whatever his name is, <laughs> when this man would ask Negro kids, stop fighting for their rights, he is lower than the lowest Negro, lower than the lowest animal that walked the face of the earth. Very sustained applause. <laughs> Please hang at your heads. Don't, don't realize this area is going to break. It's going to learn to obey the Constitution. And these teachers will be the first to go. Any good Baptist in the house? <laughs> he 
people, people murmur assent. When you go to church Sunday, look him in the face. Then pray for him. Then walk out. <laughs> the house comes down to applause and laughter. If you don't even try to get some dignity, God can't use you. They're so worried about their church. Give them their church. Give it to an empty. If you have to pray in the street, it's better than worshiping with a man who is less than a man. Um, you go back to Greenwood, I was in 63. If you go back to Greenwood in the 1980s and you look at civic events, commemorations, people talking about the history, what I find striking is the degree to which the history at the local level was being rewritten so that it was about a movement that was led by ministers and teachers. Right? Because they're the people who inherit a lot of the civic infrastructure, right? And when they look back, they tell the story to, 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 pick, to, to position people like themselves as having been at the front, as having been at the front of the uh, uh, struggle. So again, I'm, I'm just trying to say once more that, that both of these impulses, the liberatory and the conservative, uh, are present in the church. And then that's true as well, I can spend for all the institutions that, 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 that we are talking about. And, and one of the things, I'm always afraid that reducing them to either this side or that side, this kind of reductionist, right? The church is this or the church is that, right? One of my favorite examples that I'm teaching is, 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 is Malcolm's speech on the house Negro and the, and the field Negro, right? It's, it's a lot of fun. Malcolm knew that was bad sociology. He knew it was bad sociology, right? Uh, that both the field Negro and the house Negro both have liberatory impulses. They are just different kinds, right? Nothing new that more slave masters were killed by house slaves than by field slaves. He knew that history, right? And he uses that in some other schools. So anyway, all I am trying to say is that this whole notion of reducing these institutions to this or that, pro-movement or anti-movement, is just a dangerous I know I want to finish this Any questions so far that I don't want to this? So when you say the history of Greenwood was being revised, like what where, what source, specific name or book? Say that again. You were saying that the history of Greenwood was being revised so that the black ministers could actually be situated in the midst of making the changes in the civil rights movement, of, and it, which differs from what you just read from Dick Gregory. What names or people or specifically the name of a book or author? Oh, I wouldn't say a book. That was my visit back to, 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 to Greenwood. I can tell you that the organization was Greenwood Voters League, which does go out of, out, of, out, of, out of the 60s. It has a very old history, right? Uh, but when I went to their meetings in the 1980s and, 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 and saw how they were presenting to a generation that had not lived through, what had happened? Uh, um, they had made themselves central. Right? Um, and there were still a few folk who, who were willing to challenge them about that. Right? But only a few, and those few were much more marginal. The people who were quote in charge, the people who won the political office, the people who were sitting on, 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 on the school boards, tended to be people who were very comfortable with this notion that the middle class had provided leadership. But Charles, isn't it true in one sense, though, that the, uh, speaking of the Greenwood situation, the Greenwood voters name that you're talking about, that David Jordan mm -hmm. uh, is, is now the, the head of, and of course David Jordan is a state senator and a member of the Greenwood City Council. Mm -hmm. But you know, predating David was his father, Cleveland. Uh, who was out there. Yeah, yeah, right, right. okay. Uh, so, uh, at least in, in this family, Cleveland Jordan had laid the foundation in one sense that David took it back. Well, I mean, he did go ahead say it. But uh, yeah, uh, uh, took advantage of. But but then, uh, but the but the history of these voters' leagues go way back further. Right? Exactly. They predate sixties activities because that was. Clearly, one of the alternatives to the NAACP that was much more of a dangerous organization that could get you killed, but the Voters League, the name of it, at least could not get you killed, at least not ready. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> I told you I to do what we tried to do. Uh, 
No, you're right. I mean, there is a history. Yeah. And, 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 and then again, people are packaging the past in a way that is most bad advantageous to them. But the people who stepped out earliest when it was when it was most dangerous are overwhelmingly what you would call in, 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 in the Delta. It's not so much sharecroppers. Sharecroppers tend to be in the second wave. They're too economically vulnerable. Right? But it is overwhelmingly these working class people. Right, who take the risk when the risks are, are, are greater. They tend to not be the people who then come to control the civic infrastructure of African American community. Right? So they do not, even at the local level, right? uh, control the churches, control the uh, commemorations, the events. And so they lose a, they lose a kind of control of that history. So, I not really thought about institution building until this morning, but it's, as you discussed the black church, it occurs to me that one of the things that is involved in institutional build, institutional building and institutional preservation. And one way to understand the black church is uh, in that phase of, of institutional life where they're trying to preserve themselves. And so maybe it's not so much the timidity of individual pastors that's uh, the problem, but the fact that they are in charge of institutions that are, uh, I guess, inherently conservative once they're established. What do you think about that? Where, where, where is the inherently conservative? Well, because if you're conserving your past, you can conserve a revolutionary path as well as conservative. Well, there's a sense in which the institution itself is under threat if it is uh, burned down, right? If there are lots of churches become uh, objects of attack uh, during this time. So one can, in, in a very literal sense, preserving the institution means not doing anything to bring, uh, that would bring I'm not, I'm not going to find chapter nine of uh, <coughs> chapter, yeah, chapter nine of the chapter on women in my book. There's a quotation from a woman who, who, who says something like, "That's God's church. God can't protect that church. That's just too bad." Right? <laughs> uh, it depends on what you understand the institution to be, right? Well, what she's saying is the institution is not is not the Christian or mortal. The institution is the spirit of the institution. And the spirit of the institution has got to be against white supremacy. And you're not preserving the church at its core just because you don't get the, the building burnt down. Right? So, so again, there, there, there are different ways to, to I'll come back to that in a second, because you're, you're raising some really important issues about We, we don't touch on this whole notion of, 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 of people who have had a traumatic history. Uh, not wanting to talk about that, about, about that history. I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about Ella Baker as a, in a moment as a counter example, as a person who does have a really long historical memory, right? But even Ella Baker, it turns out to me, I, I found out. Uh, I think that's actually a good paper. But there, 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 there's this pattern on the black college campuses in the 1920s in which white visitors would come. And they'd say, oh, let's have all the students come together and sing those spirituals. Those are such wonderful old songs. And then the students would be dragged out from the white visitors. And then, of course, they find out from Billy Eddie. And, and Ella Baker, who always just strikes me as a very paragon of the grounded black person. Right? Right. She knows who she is. She says, when she's a Shaw, she says she refused to do that. And that's kind of, kind of struck me, right? Because when I was growing up, when I, when I grew up, I think it was 18 when I first heard of spiritual. I go back and I tell the people in my church, how come they never do spiritual? They're beautiful, right? Like that going to happen, don't come to any college, right? It was still preserving beautiful things. And, and, and the answer that I got from, from my aunts who were in charge of the churches, well, that stuff, that stuff is so painful, right? It makes me think of slavery. Trauma. It, it real clear to me that a part of the, what's funny about the way in which black people fail to preserve their own past, right? which I think is one of the most fundamental uh, issues we have in the black community, is that past is associated with so much trauma and stigma. Um, and what that means is it is very often difficult for us to pass across generations the spirit of our institutions. Sometimes we pass on the form, right? Without, without the spirit of the institution. Then another example, and I am, I, I, I am, I, I'm gonna say now that I'm speaking as a Southerner, for those of you from 
Jackson or any other constructive <laughs> black college, right? Southern was my first growing up job, and I'm still very much attached to that. Southern doesn't do anything to preserve its complicated role in, 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 in black struggle. Most of the campuses, black top campuses that I've visited, have done very little to preserve this history, right? And again, I think it is in part because of this notion of it being associated with stuff that, that they don't want to remember. I think one of the things that the, the Baptist Church came on later, but the Methodist churches apparently uh, uh, came on a little, a little more readily. And, and That's what most people believe. <laughs> so I want to. No, 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 I didn't mean to go. I heard about that because that can explain some of the institutional differences. We all heard that they had a little money, that they, they had a little more leeway because they had a structure that could, could help them a little bit. But what I'm really interested in is, is how we. And you, as a sociologist, deal with that contradiction. In other words, if we're to look at the contradiction of institutions, which is a really good idea, uh, how do we then use uh, analysis to explain why some go one way and others go another? Some churches, any institution. Why some institutions? Uh, why the why the three? You know, Williams Chapel in Louisville, you know, uh, accepts the movement and others don't. What, what is it that causes the institutions, which are neither inherently conservative or, or revolutionary, what causes them, when we look at the combination and say, within the institution, is it capacity for revolutionary activity or, or, or resisting uh, uh, activism? How do we look at that contradiction in a way that, that helps us, uh, help me explain to a student that this idea of contradiction, rather than raising it, it's out there, which it is, how do we help them explain it? Well, you know, if, 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 if you're trying to do this, you know, idea of contradiction obviously is very important to Marx, and you're trying to do it from that, that perspective, uh, then to change, you, you're going to look at how the thing that you're, the thing that you're studying is embedded in a larger political economic structure, which is changing. And the changes in the larger political structure are going to be reflected in, in which contradictions have what level of power. Right? That, that's one level. What a Marxist will almost never do. Uh, is, is, is to do this at an individual level. But if you want to ask the question literally that you're asking, uh, I would explain variations in churches. Uh, one of the things I think is really, uh, some of it ideological, I think, but for Methodist, Methodist being more activist, uh, less otherworldly, uh, Baptist, uh, sanctified, um, being slowest to come. Although I'm very sanctified, so I always say, <laughs> when we come, we will stay forever. <laughs> you other people who are here and there, right? Once the sanctified make up their mind, they're made up. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think there are some ideological differences. There are some differences in, in how well the church protects individual uh, members. Uh, one of the most important things to notice, though, in this history, is the degree to which when churches open the movement, it is not the minister who opens the church, it's the, it's the deacons and the church mothers. Uh, time and time again, it's those who have, a certain, who have the most moral authority inside the church, uh, speaking for their for their for for, their, for for the church. So that's 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 one thing to know. But it's, it's at that level of, of, of individual differences which explain a lot of how individual churches get open. There's another hand in the Actually, I was going to say something parallel to your con to what you just said in regard to the churches the, as institutions preserving these histories and reading the um, information for today that, that you have written. And coming from a background in the communication discipline, one thing became clear at that time in the media institution was that there were certain norms that they put in place that actually created um, the, the way the stories were portrayed and a lot of that being a part of the institutional standards which as you just said are supported by particularly mainstream by the dominant ideology in different cultures and whatnot and so it, it seems like for these churches that are doing this preservation the very institutional standards in and of themselves um, continue to one way or another as they repackage these histories um, find a way to sustain themselves um, by disregarding 
um, the, the working class people or the other local people who actually did, did the work. Yeah, one, one of the issues that Chicago is, is, we always say that we have more community organizing in Chicago than any place else in the country, you know, like Alinsky, Faculty Yard, CWO, all that stuff is still alive in Chicago. And so I thought one of the joys of my, my work, I like to work with lots of young organizers. And one of the roles I find myself playing, where this is, I'm just, you're making me remember why in my teaching it is so important for me to get students to not think in reductionist terms, right? Yeah. Uh, as I get a, a, a lot of hot shot, actually, why am I black now? Um, I say black. Uh, traditionally, it has been young, politicized black students who want to go into communities and organize. And so you ask them, oh, well, you have a list of all the churches. But that's my degree, and that's how you start over that everything. They say, well, they ain't gonna bother with those, those conservative Uncle Tom, blah, 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 they're on the payroll of the mayor, blah, blah, blah. And all that's true, right? <laughs> I don't want you to reduce them to them. That can be all true, but they can still, there's somebody in that congregation, there may be even some part of that conservative minister that you can tap into if you, if you realize there are other things there than just that one, that, that one set of characteristics. You've got to be able to see a certain level of possibility in people, even when it's not obvious. Right? And you lose contact with, with possibility when you reduce people to one character or the other. You're um, I'm a little worried about time. I, 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 I want to leave uh, ample time. Yeah, I really wanted to have a full hour to talk about the teaching issues. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to run through this stuff fairly quickly here if I get crazy fast. Um, slow me down. Something, something, something. Um, I do want to say something though about um, my, my answer to that, that, that great question which comes largely out of the Mississippi movement. How come that there is a moment in time, I'm going to say very roughly, from I'm going to say 61 through 66, 67, that it begins to reverse? When leadership at the community level is overwhelmingly in the hands of women in the rural areas. Ain't no argument. We can argue about the dates. Ain't, ain't, ain't no real argument. Right. COFA, those organizations. Get Jackson and they're different somewhere, right? Uh, but you go out into you go out into the country, right? And it's it's the power of women. Right? It's the Annie Divine, you know, kind of things, or Winnie Hudson. Right? Yeah. Uh, that everybody from that era Remember, the part of my answer to that, right, speculative, is, is that women have a different kind of religiosity, that joining the movement in the early 1960s is a technically irrational decision. There's no way you can make a rational argument that you're going to beat white supremacy. Right? Uh, and that therefore, you need that to, to be grounded in some belief system that is beyond the rational. Right? You, you've got to be able to say, me and God are equal in this thing, right? Uh, and and that, that kind of religiosity is a part of, that I'm just saying it's a part, right? It is my, my guess. But makes women, in, in this really high pressure, you can lose your life and your family. It's like, I mentioned it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it, 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 it's, it's women who, who step out this proportion. I, I say all that is my way of saying, and what does that, what, what, if women does that, what happened when I start to rush? If religion does that for some women, what does that for some men? The closest thing I have to answer is, is only blank. I mean, where you do, where do you find men who step up? It's Hartman Turnbull in, in, in uh, Holmes County, right? If they fire him in, 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 into his uh, home, you find his back. And when they ask him why, it's like exact quotes in both of my book and John. I love my wife like a white man loves his. I love my daughter like a white man loves his. They'll die for theirs. I'll die for mine. Right? It is that when, when they ask, when they have to register our office to register for the first time, and the registrar is trying to intimidate people, well, who's one of your people going to be the first one to step up there? Our maternal is the first one to step up there. Uh, but that kind of real staunch. Uh, I'm going to be out there first, and I'll be out there last, and I will, almost every one of them, right? I will defend myself, right, uh, if anybody attacks me. 
and our partner turned up and said, Joe, sure. Any of your people, why would you make a client? Come around here at night, I'm going to light them up like a Christmas tree. Right? Uh, Mrs. McGee, one of the reasons that some sharecroppers in Greenwood, Mississippi, could, could afford to participate is that Mrs. McGee owned a farm, and anybody got evicted from your plantation because you tried to vote, you could go stay with Mrs. McGee. You at least have, you at least have a place to, uh, to sleep. Uh, all, I don't know how many times your home was attacked, but they always attacked it from the highway. <laughs> Nobody was talking to her yard. <laughs> Acting crazy, right? Her and her boys would do for you. <laughs> they would take up. So, I mean, this staunchness, as well as this notion of armed self-defense is not a violation of nonviolence. Right? That, that's just the way we equate that and the way that the national was picking it up. Defending yourself against people who are trying to hurt you and your family, that is not being violent. Right? Uh, it is people who own land, and especially when you have cases of land-owning blacks who have land next to other land-owning blacks. So you have whole communities, right? Thinking of the harmony community here, as, 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 as well as the uh, But that's a large story about people who are being economically dependent, borrowers and beauticians. There's a whole other story there about how they disproportionately contribute to leadership and they are C.C. Bryant, maybe the best known in the home. Um, so the, the, the devil, I, I just want to say that, that in terms of what's a building, land only blacks played a, a special role in this. And I'm going to end this institution section. Uh, we don't end the slides. Uh, I just, running very quickly through, I think, what's the most familiar part of this, and that's the NAACP. Uh, it's, it, it, it explodes in membership during the 1940s. Ella Baker is the director of uh, branches, and she's, she's partly responsible for that, I think. But the climate of the times is also really responsible. Um, 1954, repression starts across the South. Membership levels out, but it begins to build up again in, in, in the like 1960s. And, and, and so it's an important part of this institution building process. Had Medgar Evers been killed in 1945, 10 years earlier, you never would have heard of it. Right? Because institutions like the NAACP and the black press in 45 were not powerful enough to get the story out. Right? Uh, by 55, they were there. So Charles Hamilton used to go back. Yeah, this is actually too independent of him, right? <laughs> <laughs> was, oh. um, Charles Hamilton Houston, uh, Harvard Law, uh, I don't have the class, uh, the Phi Beta Kappa Amherst, first black man to serve on the Harvard Law Review, 1929. And part of, by the way, my point is that, say what you want about the Lord's history, right? they are long distance runners. Yes, the, the, the plan <laughs> to, to, to get Plessy. The plan is signed off on in 1930. So you figure 1930, 1955, it took a quarter century for that plan. And they did that thing step by step. What they said they would do in 1930, they did that thing step by step, right? But one of the architects of that, Charles Hamilton Houston, right? Uh, takes over the Harvard Law School as dean in 29, says Harvard is now an instrument of struggle. A lawyer is either a social engineer or a parasite. Right? Um, and if you it's just a different way of thinking, right? Yeah. Um, uh, kicked out students, flunked out faculty. Thurgood Marshall was the next, the next slide. Uh, entered with a class of 30, graduated with a class of 10, right? Because if you could not keep up with what, what the agenda was, uh, Houston did not want you there. Uh, what he used his motto, no tea for the feeble, no crate for the dead. Um, but he created that, you know, a large part of the legal talent that was going to undermine Plessy comes out of that law school, right? And they're arguing in front of Supreme Court justices while they're still powerful, right? And that's, 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 that's a part of it. But uh, that's the national, I think that, what was that? Cool. By, by, by uh, Ruby Hill. Uh, the, uh, Ella Baker's critique uh, of the national NAACP in the 1940s is that it had become rigid. It was wedded to one method of struggle, you know, legal, legal uh, activism. It was profoundly anti-democratic and bureaucratic. It was unsupportive of, it was disdainful of the people in the field. Uh, and in her resignation,
explanation was not always very good. But, and, and, and a little bit she wrote explaining why she left the NAACP. Uh, she, she made all of those points. At the local level, the next several slides make the point, oh, you had a really different group of people from the people who were in the New York office. Mm -hmm. right? uh, you had some, a really remarkable generation of leaders um, uh, in the 1940s and 50s who are still, by and large, other than professional historians, with a few exceptions, they're still largely invisible to history. Uh, the people who, who recruited those leaders and supported those leaders uh, probably nobody more important than Ruby Hurley in the 1950s. This is her. Uh, as far as I can think of, she is the first professional civil rights worker in the South. Uh, that is to say, 1951, she comes to Birmingham and opens an office there of regional support, uh, which puts her in position, by the way, uh, to investigate the Emmett Till uh, uh, assassination, along with, along with Lake Harris. I can't find a record of anybody else who's full time based in the South before her. She gets involved with her. She's in D.C. and uh, around the Marion Anderson controversy that led to the Anderson con uh, Lincoln Memorial concert. She started organizing around that, and one thing led to another, led to another, led to another. Led to another. And then, of course, Ella Baker. Now, Ella Baker, would you give me nice three slides? Look at her ass. Look at her ass. <laughs> 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 That's a feminist statement, I believe. <laughs> you know what I mean? she, she was famous. She was famous for wearing these hats. Ella Al Baker opens up for me this whole notion of how do we think about continuity and struggle? Because this is this 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 notion that we, we can go back to slavery is something I struggle with. I don't know if I accept that or not. Let me just give you a counter argument. I'm telling you upfront, I don't know how much confidence I have in this argument. Think about it. That's a, like, I if, if you look the way we usually think about the continuity of, 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 of movements is ideology consistent across time. Leadership models, they consistent across time. Are the organizations that you have here, the organizations that you have here, right? Anybody know at the top of your head that, what, what's the name of Paul Ortiz's book on Florida? Whatever, it's a great book, trust me. <laughs> That's a hell of a struggle they're waiting for, right? Um, if you look at that book and you say, now, where did, how did they think of leadership, right? One, this is my argument, they did not think of leadership in terms of ministers, right? If you want to say, well, ministers, this is unfortunately part of that, of, 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 of that uh, movement, yes. But their models of leadership in the African American community and the uh, any time from um, the Civil War on are distinctly affected by the large numbers of African Americans who had carried arms in the Civil War. In this country, in the 1950s, you could not run for office unless you had been able to say you were wearing a uniform 10 years old. Uh, didn't matter whether you're talking about Eisenhower or your, your state senator, everyone expected you to say, if you were going to be a leader, that you had served in the services of World War II. African Americans, after the Civil War, it was very much the same thing, right? It was less whether you had been a minister, although many leaders were, but what were you doing, right? When the issue was in question, what, what did you do in the Civil War? And that becomes, in terms of African American civic life, the inspiration provided by African Americans who had carried arms is very clearly a part. You look at the meetings they had in Florida in 1914, and they're talking about what their grandparents had done in the 1860s and 1870s, right? It's real clear that there's an ideological insistence upon citizenship that is formed by what their grandparents did. If you look at the fraternal organizations that, that, that became the movement spine, it's real clear that those fraternal organizations came out of pre-slavery, right? Uh, pre-slavery, post-slavery, right? We can make the country, but, right? So what I can say is, I can find in the early 20th century, link by link, steps back to slavery or, or, or the end of slavery, right? But then if you ask the opposite question, right? Can I find in the 1960s things which link back to the 19-teens? Yeah, you know, there's the 1909, there, there is that, right? But it is not, and in many ways, it's like there are two the native, 
right? There is something to that, to that yeah. idea, right? Yeah. That certain things do not pass that early 20th century horrific period in American mobilizational life. And so that you really have sort of two periods. Now, I, that, that, that's, that's a different way. It's a question that, that I'm raising. I, I don't know, right? And one of the, the things that, that confuses me about this is how do you, how do I think about elevated roles, right? Uh, and if you know, come to Claire, well, uh, we can camp out about Mississippi without talking about Ella Baker. But, but, but the point I want to make right now is Ella Baker, who uh, graduated Shaw University in 1927, no clear, no, there's no doubt in my mind that her, her politics was shaped by her sense of what slavery was like. She wasn't a slave, right? Well, it's clear that in, in, in her family there are these stories that are recycled over the generations. Your grandmother was told by the slave master to marry so-and-so, and she said, I'll be whipped and go back to the field before I'll marry that man. And she was whipped, and she was sent back to the field. She married a man she wanted to marry. Uh, and she married a man who was famous for his racial problems, a man who was jet black and like that, like that right? Uh, a man who, after slavery, would buy part of the plantation that he had been a slave on and mortgage that land in order to support other people doing it after a flood, right? That is what with people who had strong racial pride, strong sense of community identity, right? And a strong sense that we are in charge here, right? That's her model of politics, right? And that is what she is conveying to young people at the Hall of Mind MCA in 1928. And philosophically, I don't see any difference between what she said to them in 28 and what she would say to Diane Nash and Hollis Watkins and Bob Moses in 60 and 61 and 62. It is the same notion, anti-bureaucratic, community-based, relationship-based, power must come from the bottom. She's saying that in 28, she's saying it in 60, and it's clearly based on her notion of what struggle was like in slavery, right? And right after, right? So if I wanted to find one example, right, that connects what's going to happen in the 1960s to what happens in slavery. I can find that example, all right? But now then, right, what happened, what the master narrative means is that that way of thinking that Ella Baker represents is essentially wiped out of American political consciousness, black or white. Right? That all the things that she is saying, right, you cannot trust power. You cannot trust charismatic leadership over time. Over time. Uh, that all of that is failed again. Somehow the community fails to pass that on to another generation. Yes, sir. Um, can you? Can I say more? All I'm saying, I cannot find a lot of links that take us from the 1960s to the 1860s. Ella Baker, I think, is one of the exceptions. One of the places where I can say a certain style of thinking uh, is carried across those. So, to go back to, and oh my, uh, so Ella Baker's job, national director of branches, is to just travel the south, I think, three months out of every year, town to town, hound to hound, right, organizing. Chapters of the NOAC. So that means that when she becomes the, in effect, the first uh, executive director of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, while Dr. King is still very young, very green, uh, does not have extensive contacts in the South beyond his father's network, Ella Baker has an incredible network right? and is able to use that to sort of uh, help SCLC get off to among that, the, the, the generational leadership that Rob Ruby, Ruby Hurley and Ella Baker worked with, I said there's some remarkable stories. And I think Harry, Harry Moore, oh, no, sorry. This, that was the title, Give Life, People Will Find a Way. She would always complain that these NAACP mobilized people stayed organized. And for her, that, 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 that distinction, which comes to its most powerful expression in Mississippi, right? What, what, what does it mean to organize and not mobilize? That, that, that means that if, you, if you're going to have a, a branch, every member of the branch should be a politically student. Every member of the branch needs a certain level of basic information. 
every member of the branch needs to know how to do certain fundamental things. And, and, and the fact that the New York office didn't see a need to train people in the field, that was just crazy for her, right? So she started this series of leadership conferences, uh, one of which was attended by Rosa Parks, by the way. Um, but with that title, give life to people will find a way. You develop skills, and then the people will take the movement to the next level. Your job is not to lead the people, right? It is to develop the people. So that's, that's just pure development. So if we go on to some of the other the folk who are at the core of this remarkable generation of leadership, and Mississippi is just, ooh, these people make you love, but, 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 but Florida, Harry and Harry T. Moore. Uh, he's president of the Florida branches of the NAACP at the time that he was killed. Next slide. Uh, at the time he was killed, he was protesting what was an apparent lynching by the sheriff of some county in Mississippi. He shot while escaping. That kind of, that kind of mention. But he, Harry Moore, was, was doing that. He was protesting the, the refusal of many registrars in, in Florida to uh, uh, register blacks to vote. And on Christmas Eve, 1951, his home was blown up and he and his wife were both killed. And the funeral, this is the next. Um, it was, again, like. like um, some of the mid-50s funerals in, in Mississippi, people were no longer afraid to be seen at the funeral of a black, group, of, of a black leader who had been killed. People came and they were just flat out angry and, 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 and they wanted to have been. I think it must have been 20 years before they convicted the fight. Oh, no. Uh, E.D. Nixon. Right? Um, I served at least two terms as president of the Alabama State Conference of Branch, as president of the Montgomery NAACP. There's Nixon, of course, along with Joanne Robinson, and this battle of who gets more credit, for creating the platform onto which Martin Luther King steps out. Right? But they are the ones who organize, who organize Montgomery. They are the ones who make it possible. Um, I think I'm saying this with. Mrs. Uh, Parks is arrested on Friday. By Monday, you have uh, a boycott that is estimated to be 95% effective in the black community. You can organize 40,000 people over the weekend. How? How? Because they had such long overnighting history. They had such deep networks in this uh, area. Edie Nixon is, is, is fundamentally affected by the next slide. This guy, April Randolph, president of the Brotherhood of State called Porter, right? And Nixon always, Nixon starts organizing cucumber pickers in Alabama in the 1930s. That whole notion just strikes this blows my mind, right? Um, but he's a, he, he, he is a union organizer, right? He, he is not fundamentally out of ministerial position. Mr. Not so more. I think the next couple are though. Let me see. No, he, no, he's a non-minister too, right? Uh, John McCrae. People used to say in the 1940s that the toughest black leadership in the South, that group in, in, in South Carolina, they were aggressive. They were pretty close to being socialist communists, right? Just the Simpsons, I think, probably had a card in there first someplace. Um, the folk always said they're really aggressive folk and very much uh, Smith versus all right in 1944. Very much inspired by that. The voter league movements across the South, one of the strongest, comes out of this group in, uh, in, in South Carolina. And I decided for time reasons, not talk about the black press, but the light, and Lighthouse and Informer uh, was one of about a half a dozen Southern black newspapers that were forthright and staunch in their opposition to white supremacy. It was very difficult to run that kind of newspaper in the South and not be put out of business, uh, run out of town. Uh, but McCray is among those folk, uh, among those folks who, who did it. One of the folks with whom he worked uh, is the next slide. Who was on? He is a minister, but only nominally, in, he, he joined the NOCP like people join the Moanas today. It's a fashionable thing to do. <laughs> uh, he organizes Clarendon County, South Carolina, right? And that becomes Griggs versus Elliott, which then becomes, actually, it, it may have been more important than the Topeka, Kansas case in terms of its legal import, right? The job he does is organizing on the ground is just fantastic. And this, by the way, is one of the places I know of in the country for calms and up. And, 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 and which the African American community has maintained some control over its own history. They have gotten the history of Clarendon County written into 
the statewide curriculum for the state of, 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 of South Carolina. So this history is just so remarkable, right, which they came together, right, in the 40s and the 50s. Uh, every school child in South Carolina is now supposed to get that history. I'm going to go back and find out. So I think uh, uh, I would not say very much because you're going to meet a whole lot of folks uh, the next, next little while who knew Mike Rivers. They're almost, there may not be another person in the movement who has the consistent depth of respect that he has. Right? People, there, there, there are a lot of great folks in this history, right? Uh, Mentally, he gets a whole new level of respect, even among this group of people. Right? Um, so there's not much I have going to this building. The house, which I think is the next slide, uh, you'll be building this afternoon and we shot in that drive. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and oh, I think I have it wrong. Let me see what, what the next slide is. I think. This I wanted to say something about. At the at the Merle Everest kissing uh, her slain husband. She was enraged at the way in which the New York City, New York NWCP, NAACP officials from New York come down and they give the standard civil rights speeches. Oh, what a horrible place Mississippi is. These people are murderers. What a great man Medgar was. Please make your contribution to the NAACP. <laughs> and not only, if she had had a gun, she would kill you. Because <laughs> uh, when her husband was alive, and it was real clear in the latter months of his life that they were coming for him. And when people were asking their office, give him some kind of security for the little bit sake, right? They're arguing with him over his expense accounts, right? I mean, just the, 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 it's like they cannot get it through their heads, right? What this man's sacrificing, and they just, left, they just left him out there on his own. That's what she felt at the moment of his death, right? And there's a period of time at which she had no use for the OCP. It's ironic that she will then later become uh, the chairperson of, 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 of the board. But at that moment, right, I am just trying to say that she had, had no use for it. Now, I think the last slide there, the, Dick, this is the, the funeral. I am assuming that would have been Paris Street. Uh, this this Medgar Evans' funeral, and, and Dick Gregory said, We had so many people, we're going to march on God that day. Uh, and part of what's different, though, it says something about who Medgar Evans was and what he represented in the state. In the next one, you see yeah, that, that picture. It's young men, right, uh, coming from the kinds of folk who might not have been a part of the movement before death, before Medgar's death. Medgar touched, touched some of people in the So I'm going to, I think the next slide goes in. Oh, I'm sorry. I the, one. the one I wanted to get says something like Californian killed Mental Reference. <laughs> right. <laughs> or or Reference Because Byron Del Beckwith had spent some time in California. He's from the Delta. Right. <laughs> uh, that's, 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 uh, I think that's all in that part of the slide. Now, now what happens? Uh, uh, just, I don't know what to do now. Would you guys do it? Um, this is. Prelude to our having a discussion of freedom summer. This is uh, the buses to Oxford, Ohio, where they came the train before they came down here in June, uh, before they left. And the next slide, the thing is just a demonstration. I'm pretty sure this was in Greenwood. And the next one is a Freedom School. And the last one, I think, is this one. Trying to change the women who were killed. They were killed while some of the people are still being trained in Oxford, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, so I, I, I want to stop there. And, and, and so the, obviously, the, uh, well, I did mean to say uh, that in terms of Medgar's work, one of the most important things he did, when it reached the point that the terror in the late 1950s was so strong that it drove black adults away from the movement, Medgar's always, what, what can you do, right? He organized youth leaders. NWCP youth chapters. And what that meant was that when Cora Snick come into the, in, 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 the state, they have these modules of young people, some of which Leslie has referred to, who are already politicized. They already have relationships among one another. And so those other more radical youth oriented organizations can take on these what, what sociologists call co-optable networks. Right? And so that's a part of the reason they are able to get off. So, So, 
why we have why we have food? Let me just say that the think of the the, the NWCP's growth in this period as, as a kind of a it, 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 it's quite a period of civic expansion in black communities. It's not just uh, NWCP, but the voters lead movement, which takes over the South in the 1940s. Organizations in Montgomery, like the Women's Political Caucus. And, and an important way, even though it's not a community institution, the Highlander Research Center, which is offering a kind of organizing expertise to community groups, uh, and, and uh, eventually leads to a civic capacity. So part of what I'm saying is that a whole variety of ways, civic capacity in African American communities, especially after World War II, is changing. But if that means, on one hand, it's much easier to sustain activism, to keep activists alive, although it's quite a number in Mississippi who are killed or driven out of the state between, say, 55 and 60. Right? No one expected Medgar Evers to survive the 50s. Right? That was just, people just thought that that, 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 that couldn't happen. Nonetheless, Medgar Evers, Aaron Henry, and in war, um, and all of them do manage one way or another to, to survive the decade. Um, that, I think, is a function of greater civic capacity in part. But at the same time, I, what would that have meant if there had not been concomitant changes in the social structure? What would that have meant if FDR, for totally unrelated, totally unrelated reasons, had not liberalized the, the US Supreme Court in the 1930s? Because he needed to do that to get his economic power. What would that have meant in the 1950s if the Soviets were not using the American race situation in 75% of all of their anti-US propaganda? Right? They were putting this kind of stuff down. Right? Uh, well, this is what American democracy means. It means Alabama. It, it means Mississippi. What would it have meant right, if this, what was then called the Third World had not been formed, and if this country had not been worried about losing the Third World? To the, to the Soviets. Uh, it's really clear that the Ken Kennedy administration left to its own devices, right? Uh, you know, who? If they did not feel this issue of being embarrassed of foreign affairs, they would have let situations go on for quite, for quite some time. So I want to say one, I'm emphasizing that these changes in civic capacity. At the same time, there's a broader structural context. Any, anything about that anybody wants to comment on, raise questions about before we switch? One, two. Well, my comments is, I mean, my comments are direct or, um, directed towards some of the things that you said. Um, I am a Tigley College graduate, and um, what happens is, and I'll just give you a little funny, the minute you start to talk about Joyce Latin and what I did, because we're Facebook friends, I basically told her, I said, hey, guess what? They're talking about you right now. <laughs> so she's coming back. And I told her, I said, you know, I said, I said, Charles Shane is talking about you. She said, well, what did he say? <laughs> <laughs> and then she said, laughing loud. And then I told her what she said. She said, it's a hot. Great. And so what happens is, but one of the people that you mentioned was Annie Devon. And at Tulu College, what happens is, is go back to your comment about mobilization versus. Can I just say, for people don't know, and Annie Devine is an important leader from Canada, Mississippi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> and at Tulu College, we had, um, I had the fortune in the early 1990s to, we were doing um, celebrations of some rights movements. So I had an opportunity to um, introduce her at our, mm -hmm. at Tulu College, we had, uh, well, Time that I was going, we used to have a Humanities Week. And so they would bring in people, various people, and this is Humanities Week focused on civil rights. So in our historic chapel called Woodward Chapel um, on the campus, um, I had an opportunity to interview Ed Devon. And so what happens is the one thing that stood out to me about her, it goes back to your comment about mobilization versus organization. And I think that that's pretty much in the spirit of Tudor College. What happens is that by having me to introduce, we were, they were teaching us organizational networks. So they would bring us in. Many of us did not know because we were 30 years out from the movement. So we didn't really know. So they were basically looking at and training us in that element. But one of the things that stood out to me and going into this whole conversation with people that you've introduced, um, the 
the, the key was that what the NAACP meant. I'm from an area, um, Gulfport, Mississippi, where I grew up knowing, you know, Dr. Mason and all these other people who are made, the man who delivered me, yeah, the man who delivered me was Felix Dunn. So he was a huge in the civil movement. So the first person who ever held me was a white activist. But for the most part, one of the things that I didn't know until Miss Annie Devine said it, and it goes back to where women was very important. It goes back to the conversation about the church. I always understood the church, that the church is always coming from what the membership allows, their leaders. The leaders can be powerful, but then you also have the membership that can help to most definitely shape, like you said, to the deacons and the women. And so one of the things that Annie Devine said that really strengthened my resolve at the NAACP is that um, this organization gave an opportunity for us to define ourselves. So there is you know, you know, yeah, she said that she said for the most part you, you have that disconnect at the national level, which I can tell you as the president of the local branch in the NAACP still exists. Okay? But for the most part what on the local level, what we got is that that was the first time I ever heard anyone speak of an institution, at least the ideas that's helping, that helps people to define themselves. And it was a beautiful way in which she did it because of course she put it in the context of, you know, um, in my father's house there are many rooms. And it was a beautiful piece about how she connected it to religion. But in essence, she talked about the NAACP as being an organization that helps people to help to define themselves in their citizenship. And it was the first time, and I'm gonna conclude that because you brought up a lot of the points about Evers training. Um, my people are from Newton, so you know, you got Takeda. But what happens is that training the youth, but one of the pieces that Ms. Um, Annie Devine brought to my attention that day at Wetworth Chapel, as a 20 year old, one of the things that she brought to me was I started to, the NAACP for her at that moment in reflection or whatever, was there was a difference between freedom and liberty that she connected to her citizenship. You know, I think. Um So many of us tend to identify with the younger, more younger in the 1960s, more radical organizations, thinking core. That we forget in the 1950s that there was a special bond in the Deep South among folk who were willing to put their names on the WC membership. That, that uh, it took more guts than most of us would have had. Just that, just that simple. Right? Most people did not do it. We would not have been different. And what's standing together during those days was so very, very few people were like, it created an intense bond among those who do. An intense loyalty, an intense loyalty to the idea, the principles of the NAACP. Um, and again, it's just real hard for us who are not part of that generation to realize how much it did represent freedom for a certain group. Derek? Yes. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that took notice of was on the slide where you had the newspaper with Medgar Evans' assassination. And there's a quote, and this kind of goes to this narrative uh, that, that we're, we're talking about. Is there a state reacts to slaying with shock? <laughs> How could Mississippi <laughs> yeah. be shocked? And so it, it creates this idea, right, in terms of collective memory and collective identity with how we talk about kind of what's happened in the past. And then how do we, again, translate that, and transform that to generations who come after that time period and think about you know, who people are and what do they mean at particular points in time. And so I just think even that headline, as we think about it, when I read it, I instantly thought about uh, working on this project. I thought about uh, uh, Trayvon Martin. Mm. Right. Um, right. And so, 
I'm just thinking, you know, 50 years later, we're still shocked <laughs> that black men, young black men are dying at the hands of, uh, you know, these, these types of kind of policies and things like that. So I, there, I think there's just something heavy there uh, that on paper, it can read one way, except when we talk to young black men, they're worried about what might happen to them on the streets in 2014. So I just, I just picked it on there. I'm not going to allow any conversation about this point right now, but I will find that right? when we sort of switch into how you teach freedom or something. The, the greatest, I, one of the things I do that I, have, I get the most kick out of, right? I know a part of the group that uh, has taught, uh, we, we run children's defense fund freedom schools in the Woodlawn neighborhood of the South Side of Chicago. This will be our, 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 fourth, our fourth and second summer. And part of what you do in the freedom school is create safe space for kids. And uh, relationships, and we they can talk about anything they want to talk about. And over the last three years, just consistent, our oldest kids are just, I think our, our oldest are now 11 years old. The kids are the world come in. The consistent pattern, <coughs> when you sort of open up space and let kids talk about it, is for boys to talk about physical vulnerability. The girls are talking about sexual vulnerability. Even at that age, right? They feel, you step outside your house, you're in play, right? and you're at danger. Right? But for the boys, it's this notion that every male who is not living, not in your family, not living on your block, almost really that specific, right, is a potential danger to you. Right? So I'm trying to complicate the question. Right? That, 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 uh, I guess I'm giving away the rest of my lecture. Right? <laughs> that for me, Freedom Summer is how do you teach about the devaluation of black life in the context of 1964? And how do you teach about the devaluation of black life in the context of 1964? Or context of black life in 2014. And again, that's all. I'm just trying to raise the question. And I think maybe we'll come back to that in a bit. But this notion. I think this is one of the differences between the black and white reaction to, to things like Trayvon Martin, is that black people have this visceral sense. It's a long list of folks. It goes back many decades, right? And we, we're not reacting just to Trayvon Martin. We're reacting to all of the others, right, who came before him. It is not something that is isolated. And there aren't as many white people who can see it from that kind of perspective. Which raises some issues about how do you teach white students Right, a more historically informed way of looking at the social world. Have you ever heard the term ahistorical individualism? Mm -hmm. uh, it is, uh, Michael Moffat, the anthropologist, spent uh, a year living in the dormitory at Rutgers University trying to understand how kids think. Right? Uh, no jokes, no jokes, right? <laughs> yeah, whatever. Um, and in terms of his, the way in which he comes out characterizing the social stance of white students at white universities, that's the way, it's ahistorical and it's individualistic, right? Uh, it's, and you guys sort of fill in, fill in the blanks, right? But in terms of how we think about what we are teaching to, and, and there is, by the way, a black version of, of, of ahistorical individualism, but maybe not whatever it is. So what we are teaching to, that's a part of it. There is an exhibit in Brooklyn, and I was in Brooklyn, New York, and it's called A Subtlety. Um, it's called and A Subtlety, and it's by Kara Walker. And what she did was that she was at the Domino Sugar Factory, mm -hmm. and she made a, what really, if you look at it, it looks like a Mammy Sphinx. And the face is that of Mammy. And so when you're looking at it, and she has the butt, she, you can see the, the um, bust, I mean, the, the breast and everything, and so when you go in, this, um, this, it's, this, it's the former uh, Domino Sugar Factory. When you go in, and I had to wait, and I was so happily, I was happily waiting. I had to wait like 20 minutes to get in because the lines were that long, That's cool. you know, to see this exhibit. So this huge, I mean, think of the Sphinx, and then think of that side, literally think of that side, and then think of a face of Mammy at the front. 
And that's what she did, and then she had the, the breast there. But in the back, um, what she had was the back of the sphinx, you have a vagina. And so she was saying with that, the exploitation she put for the sugar factory, the sugar plantations, she put Mammy as the face black, the black experience, not history from top of looking at the people who owned it, but she put Mammy there at the front. And then in the back, she talked about the exploitation. And so in many ways, she connected a historical moment of sugar plantations in its economy, like you did in the first chapter, you said in your book, and then she basically looked at the sex of exploitation. So therefore, you're talking about the Chicago youth. You see the vulnerability of the violence that's there that they can sort of live in. And this one, looking at this one piece of art, she has also um, different little guys there around and they have baskets, whatever. And um, but looking at this one piece of art, and I heard young people, when I say young people, I mean 10, 11, and 12, able to make the connection by looking at this piece that they had experienced at this Domino Sugar Factory. They were able to bring in sugar plantations and ex exploitation, and then also see it in the exploitation of women and the black female experience. It's going to go off, unfortunately, on um, offline, I mean, the, the exhibit. That is, again, a very ahistorical way to think about it. So how do you begin to get them to think about this violence in a more historical therapy kind of uh, so it's connected to a longer and, and, and a deeper kind of history. Right? So it doesn't just become a problem that gets reduced to individual character and their life. Right? How do you construct that narrative? At the same time, how do you construct a narrative that gets inside of the heads of the boys who are doing the killing? Right? Uh, and make them understand what they're doing. So how do you speak to both of these audiences right? uh, as, 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 as teachers of history? How do you do it? And I, <laughs> well, because last night, um, Deborah and Katie and I were having a conversation, and so I am new at Miami, and I mean, you've been so great today. I'm, I'm learning so much, and how do you do it? Because well, I, I can tell you if I wanted to. <laughs> I mean, well, I'm just, I mean, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I just have to, I'm, how do you do it? I, I told them a couple of my experiences, you know, things that I use, and I don't even, in Georgia, and the uh, honest responses from my students at Miami, Ohio University, I was like, I was, in, we live in parallel universities. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, what's my entry point? Um, so it was interesting. Deborah shared some awesome things at the table last night. But I mean, when you're teaching this history, and you know, we were talking about the discomfort of students, and then even your own discomfort vulnerability in it. So how, how, I mean, how have you done it? Like a practical experience when you first started doing it? I, I don't know. I mean, how, how do you do it? I mean, how, how do you, uh, how can I have a good memory? not to see myself as an object. And unfortunately, the people who I think kill people, I mean, whoever they are, like, that's why I went back to Tudor College that day. She told me to define myself. And that was the first time that someone actually said they define themselves. So therefore, it's this idea of objectification. Unfortunately, the reason that it's what complicates a lot of the narrative is that we are still viewed as objects. That's why it's a shock. And unfortunately, we objectify you know, in this conversation. Blackness in itself is an object. We teach it as a social construct, but it's an, uh, one of the things I love about your book here, I read the book years ago, but then I you know, read chapter one, it's this idea in which we are still trying to define ourselves. When you talk about how people look at their narratives, we um, the, I'm very safeguarding. So even when Joy said, what did he say? It's this idea of defining ourselves not as objects. And unfortunately, that's, Part of the issue, while it may shock white America for A, B, and C to happen, is because blackness is a social construct that unfortunately is an object that's been commodified and consumed and packaged that's actually constantly consumed and packaged. Well, I'm going to send to, to Jeff. 
a speech that Vincent Harding gave. Yeah, I'm asking you to share. Uh, at the orientation for Freedom Summer Volunteers, right? And the part of it that I would like you to see, these are, this, is, this is in Oxford, Ohio, before the kids go down, right? And he's trying to give, get into their heads, right? None of you are prepared for what you're about to see, right? Come here out of Stanford and Harvard does not prepare you for a life in Mississippi. First of all, some of you are racist yourselves, right? Some of you use black people to construct an image of yourself, right, that is favorable, right? So you are, from jump, objectified, right? Some of you are coming down for a romantic adventure with a black person because you think that's exotic. That's also objectified. When you get there, some black Mississippians are going to be angry at you before you walk into the door. They are objectifying you, right? This was Vincent Harvey, right? Uh, it is 1964, right? Just take a look at that. Right? And, and think about that as, 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 as a teaching tool around this whole notion of us using other people right? in all ways. And it's not that the high do it to the low, the low are doing it back to the high. Right? Uh, but as a teaching tool, it's, it's an elegant piece. And I cut off my hand from over here. I can't think of, I'm trying to think of a film that talks about objectification of black people as a social, it's old and it's from, I teach in a place that has mostly white students, a lot of working class students, and I, I, in January, teach a very intensive course, about 60 hours, um, about 30 students, about young people and women in the movement. This year, for the first time, I started with that film. It is so um, basic and understanding that so many people don't bring with them. I mean, they bring it, but they're not conscious of it. That created an incredible environment for conversations that are self-reflective, self-critical. is so fun. That's what we're trying to do. But then let me just say that, that, that I'm a firm believer that as much as I think folk need to know civil rights history, and that it has a different kind of value for black and white students, that I elaborated someone that, that, that I'm the fact that Americans, and I'm going to say right now, white Americans, have completely lost contact with the history of the labor, labor movement in this country creates enormous problems for our ability to analyze social problems in our time. Right? But it's just like a hole right in your head. Right there. You hit the point just now that I was going to attempt to make that we are now in a place where we don't have the same institutions in place that we give credibility to as we did back at the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement. And I think one of the issues with many of our youth is that we, we can't quantify this for them so that they can analyze the social problems that they deal with. And then this whole idea of power Power has shifted considerably. And during the early civil rights movement, we knew what we were fighting. We were fighting injustices. We were fighting violation of civil rights. Now we are fighting such bigger issues because, and I will make this statement, and I've kind of been holding all this for a minute. <clears throat> the NAACP now, in its functional area, has to be expanded so that it deals with all people of color. Because it's not just a black-white issue now. It is a color issue. And the people that are fighting in the movement are not just black. They are black and white. And this goes back to kind of the culture of institutions. There are lots of people in institutions now that are friends. For instance, there might have been a time when I and Jeff were seen as opposites, but now we're on the same page. Mm -hmm. Some of our opposites are exactly what you talked about, maybe another black person or maybe another white person. That's who we're fighting. And that's part of what we need to address. So these little black kids in Chicago don't really have an identity. So how do we, how do we say that to them? Uh, well, and I think that's part of what happens even in our classrooms 
when we're dealing with black and white. All of the young people are in, such a, are in search of an identity. So can I give them that identity from a humanistic viewpoint? Because the guy, in, the guy at Stanford may have the greatest love in the world for all the injustices that I have a great love for, but has he ever experienced them? So how do I take him down that road so that we are all on the same team, working for the same purposes? That's enough. But in fairness to the NAACP, and I'm, I am going to be, I'm, I'm an advocate, and I'm so sorry. We did come out. I mean, in fact, we were on the on the cusp of coming out with LGBTQA. I mean, basically, they when they met down in Florida, it came up. Um, there was 64 people on the on our national board of directors, and 62 went with supporting the LGBTQA. And so, therefore, we linked with the LGBTQA community. I mean, if you look at our literature, we go for black and brown when we look at prison rates or light source. So we engulf people of all people because we focus on civil rights. We like to say that we, unlike a church organization, we are a civil rights organization. We are not a church organization. So therefore, when the, L the issue of LGBTQA rights came up, the NAACP unquestionably in one meeting you know, approve that they would go for that because that was a civil rights issue. So I just wanted to say that because I know this is being filmed and I don't want anybody <laughs> saying that I didn't trust that issue. <laughs> and, and, uh, and when, when responding to how to teach it um, from her comments, uh, I guess I'm speaking more to practical things. Um, and what some of you have actually done. Right. Okay. Thanks. And but your point speaks to um, the fundamental um, crux of the issue. And I think that was important. Can, can, can we stay there for a second? Some of the things you could judge. We're really trying to get students, and we use that language about self reflections, um, to be more self reflective in terms of understanding the behavior, of their own behavior, and those immediately around them. You think about that way, that applies to kids in Harvard, it applies to kids off the street, right? How do you get them to think more deeply about the, the wellspring of their own behavior? Now that said, how do you teach to that? Uh, so one thing that I do, I come from a background in educational theater, is I mix up the pedagogy. So instead of just having readings and lectures and discussion, um, I employ a technique called process drama, which takes students through an experience of kind of creating a universe, um, so you could create a universe of the Freedom Summer, taking them through an in-roll experience, which of course, they don't leave knowing what it was like to do that, but they, it creates a little bit more empathy, um, and being in-roll and having things happen to you in-roll creates a little bit, makes it a little bit more immediate and a little bit more personal than reading about it happening to somebody else, and I use that as a way to open up discussions. Um, and I found that that actually um, breaks down resistance a little bit. So students who might come in feeling like, oh, I, I know all about this, or like, you know, I'm too cool for this or whatever, being in the role going through dramatic activities can reduce that resistance and make them uh, more reflective and more willing to engage in discussion. And one of the things that, that, that Schmidt created here in Mississippi was something called the Free Southern Theater, uh, which did that, right? It was a traveling company going from town to town doing politi political drama, right? allowing people to respond. Some other ideas, please? I'll just echo, uh, piggyback on the, um, well, I do role plays a lot, and I think that's really successful um, with getting students to think outside of themselves. Um, and, and they tend to remember these roles that they play long after the class is over, more than lectures or um, uh, in other types of activities. And I think discussions as well, getting into those, starting with small group discussions and then branching into larger class discussions, whole class discussions, um, and taking it with questions that they raise themselves. And I, I don't know if anyone has tried, there's a um, new pedagogy, maybe not so new, reacting to the past. And there's one on the civil rights movement. Um, and I haven't done it yet, but I'm hoping to try it next uh, semester. Uh, and it's this gameplay of, of role playing, essentially, where they make speeches and rebuttals and they even sing freedom songs to open up the class. So 
um, I, that might be an effective strategy to use. And they have lots of different modules, not yeah. just civil rights. And the idea is students are assigned a, both real and fictional historical actors. Mm -hmm. And so they have to voice the perspectives of someone who they might fundamentally disagree with, but they have to try and be persuasive and get others in the class to sort of give them points for having been effective at making their case. So it's sort of an amplification of the role play idea. I do anti-racist um, um, workshops for our university. So I get the students for four hours. And it's like an um, introduction to all of this. And it's like all incoming freshmen or something like no, that? No, I wish it were. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the faculty will send their students. Um, so in, in different departments and, and across the university. Um, uh, and, and we start with um, teaching, giving them a foundation in history. And, and again, I only have four hours. So, so we hit on the important points of history that are codified by law. So there's no arguing with it. Um, we also <laughs> talk about the issues of white privilege. And one of the things I tell them is four that <laughs> I want them to see, I want them to be able to see what white privilege is. And so I have a particular exercise that I do with them that helps them to see for themselves what it is. We talk about the issues of power. We call it P1, P2, P3. So the power over people of color, the power that, that um, the power of privilege basically and then the power that racism has to destroy all of us. And then we talk about the importance of organizing. Um, education around the issues of racism is really important, yes. We must do that, yes. There's some identity work that you have to do on your own, yes. And you need to know more about what that is. But the real key to changing our society is on organizing. And then how do we do that? And we give some real specific examples um, about that. Um, and, and we present a, a new paradigm in terms of a way of thinking about organizing. So as they go into their uh, student organizations, they have, they have questions that they can ask uh, um, about their organizations that help them to know what the level of consciousness is and to really begin to shape that organization so that it has a consciousness and awareness around these issues as they move forward. And then I send them back to the classrooms too everybody else. So they have a foundation at least to begin those conversations with. We also do it for faculty. You know, workshops is also for faculty and also for administrators and also for community members. And we consider having it in the community is really, really, really important. We can't just stop our work on the campus. That's interesting. I've never said it. I was teaching at Williams College, a really rich college, right? And I invited someone from a Native American campus. Native American was racial. One of these beautiful buildings, right? That certain ideas cannot come into certain places. Right? The idea of the reservation cannot exist in the idea of the knowledge. Right? I want to come back to a lot of what you said. Uh, we can have a, you want to do a little workshop? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we only have a few minutes. I mean, I'm Derek, you on mine. Yeah, I was going to say, I've, I've taught at the uh, high school level, the community college level, but not at the university level. And I just want to preface what I'm going to offer by giving you that context. And I'm not taught differently at any level. Uh, the primary way that I try to teach is everything I do is connected. So there is no one assignment. There is no one activity. The assignment is connected to the learning. So everything that I do is filtered through critical thinking. So it's going to be reflected. Uh, I, I, so uh, the, the, the main point is that I, I, a student said to me that this is like the last day of class, and I had them do this, uh, this assignment where they had to, to look at something in the media and they had to write a critical analysis of it, and then they were meeting with me one-on-one -on -one to talk about what they looked at. And the student came to me and he said, you always have us thinking. And to me, that was like, <laughs> that was like, that was perfect. <laughs> because what the reality is that as they leave, this is kind of going what you're talking about with the training, as they leave our classes, what are they taking away? Right. Right. I know that the students won't do most of the reading. I know that. Right. I know that they're going to part-time half the assignments. I can't control those things. And so I try to structure my class in such a way that even when they leave, they may see something. And it just connects to, this is something I need to think about. And so I try to just structure my class so that the discussions, the lectures, the readings, the assignments, uh, the, the short videos that I showed, the activities that we do, 
they're all connected in the long continuum of building awareness. Maybe one. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Don't just use it. No <laughs> Anyone else want to make, in, in terms of how you try to teach in a way that's going to move students towards self reflectivity about issues of inequality in particular? One, two. Um, you mentioned one of the very first things you said was about the fear of So in January in my course, I had a teaching apprentice who was a poet, a spoken word artist. And, and this, this student said to me, we are going to learn this stuff with poetry. So this is a, a young African American transgender female male um, senior about to graduate, hated him every minute. It was just such a hard place for him to be. He brought to our class this is one example, a text that I ended up having all the students buy, called um, A Reef for Emmett Till. And it's a crown of sonnets. There were 30 students in the class. It has 14 pages of words. The students paired up. So Kavi organized this. The students paired up. Every pair of students rehearsed and prepared their page. And then they performed it for our guests. And it's just, um, so it's written by Marilyn Nelson, who was um, nine years old when Emmett Till was killed, and she'd been thinking about this her whole life. And she wrote the poem when she was, I don't know, maybe in her 50s with the Guggenheim. She took a whole year to write this, Crown of Sonnets. The students performed it for Danielle McGuire, who was the author of one of the texts that we read. And McGuire teaches at Wayne State. She wrote a book called At the Dark End of the Street, Black Women Rape and Resistance, A New History of the Civil Rights Movement. She was in tears on the second sonnet. And the students went around the whole circle. And it was just you know, visceral. And it connects to Trayvon Martin. And it connects to all the other people whose names we don't know. The students brought all of that up. All they had to do is study one page of words, which everybody had memorized. And when they performed it for someone who had never seen the book, it was just, I mean, like the whole room was filled with emotion. And I believe that that sticks much more firmly than even Charles King's <laughs> book. Oh, that's the R. That's the R. That's the R. I was just going to say, I, um, I did my bachelor's, my master's, my PhD at Michigan State, and I had the privilege of working with um, Dr. Richard Thomas, who he does a lot. Uh, he started an organization at Michigan State um, called the Multiracial Unity Project, and it has grown since it was spread on the heels of the O.J. Simpson verdict, and it's turned into um, an all-over campus uh, within the dorms, getting kids of not only different ethnic, racial, religious, uh, sexual orientation, just all kinds of different backgrounds together, dialoguing. Sure, um, I it again. Um, the multiracial unity living experience, and um, basically, he, he's coming at it, Dr. Thomas, who started this, he's coming at it from a Baha'i um, religious background, where, you know, really emphasizing the organic unity of human life, the human race. So one of the things I try to do in my class in an ideal universe, this is what I was teaching when I was a grad student at Michigan State, um, was sending my students out of the classroom and participating in Emerald um, one day a week. They had to do something like that. So if you know we're coming from universities that have that apparatus in place where we can draw on those things, thinking of institution building, I think that's a really great place, taking students out of the classroom and you know using whatever resources but with this question of how to, how to teach white kids that have a disconnect with the struggle of um, you know, African Americans in the US, I think one of the big things I like to do is uh, show part of the 
documentary Race, the Power of an Illusion, the first one which really emphasizes that race is a complete um, you know, social construction, had no biological basis. I see some students' heads kind of spontaneously explode. Uh, at the end of just that first segment, they really seem to respond to that. And then later, I like to use Tim Wise. Um, he just came out with a new uh, documentary last year on white privilege. And it's a little bit more for white students who haven't interrogated their privilege. It can be a little, I think, abrasive. Um, based on the first time I showed it, I heard some African American students coming up to me saying, ooh, we were getting some you know, whisperings and comments in the back row. But kind of trying to layer onto that, I like what you said about everything is connected so that you can um, you know, really build on these things. But I think for white students, narratives are really important. And what you were saying about objectification of black people, white students, I mean, I think that that's one of the struggles in reading personal stories, whether it's a slave narrative of Solomon Northup or, um, you know, Asada, whatever it is, so that students can really get into that mindset and understand. To start my class, I teach race in the United States, one of the classes. I have every student write a racial narrative. And so many students, particularly white students, say, I've never thought about it. So it doesn't, it, it takes the responsibility off of me of telling them, think about it, because they have to write about it. And so that's why I, I tell my students, we, we I, students will say we write more than in English class, but writing is a thinking activity. So because I need you to think, I'm going to put you to write. But kind of going to me, one of the most difficult things is how do you get people to question their assumptions about making them feel that you're being personally attacked? And if you do it that way, there's no personal attack. Both of them, which, and, and white students can be really, really sensitive about this. And there's a time, oh, you get the last. <laughs> this, is, this is just very quickly. Um, there's a Southern, I mean, a South African greeting that, and I can't say it in the language, but the essence of it is, I see you, okay? So I have my students match, such as a black and a white, and I'll usually use opposite sex, and have them say that with meaning and then talk about what that means to them. One of the, one of, one of the best practices that I've created is that every human being wants to be recognized. So how can we be recognized in our classroom? That's by having, because sometimes I might walk in and see Johnny, who's an Anglo-Saxon, and, and have these preconceived notions about who he is and objectify him. You know, you're just a rich white boy, whatever. And then when I see him, his story is 100% different. You know, I know that. Uh, I'm not even looking at you. I look at this side of it. <laughs> uh, when I teach in Chicago in that large Irish population, I, I learned Irish history. So I could teach them about the time in the 1890s when the Irish ghettos looked like black ghettos now. In terms of unemployment, fathers leaving, um, alcoholism, violence. Right? And I don't, you don't have to say the thing, right? That's the context, not the people. They'll, they can make that link, right? If you just give them material. For the, these are Irish, right? And again, it, it has that advantage of, I'm not attacking you, right? I'm just trying to get you to think beyond right, the, what you can see in your media environment. One of the things that I had meant to say, one of the questions I will leave you with is a question, right? What is a white way to teach freedom summer? What is a black way to teach freedom summer? That's just a question. I just have to occur to me that, that you might want to think about that. In terms of, for me, this broad issue of, 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 of teaching the, 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 the Civil rights movement, obviously, at one level, it's to attack the master narrative. But pedagogically, one of the most powerful ways I've found to do it is to teach it through the eyes of black women. Right? Yeah. There are a whole lot of ramifications to that for all kinds of students. No matter what background they come from, their taken for granted narrative is not the narrative of black women. Right? So that narrative challenges everybody. Right? Within that, right, the moment kids meet Ella Baker, then they come away with this, with, 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 with what I want as a, as a teacher, right? Uh, they come away with a visceral sense that history is social, socially constructed. And they're all wondering, well, if they didn't teach me on Ella Baker, what else was left out of the history they had been teaching me, right? What else have they lied to me about, right? And that's where you want them, except then you want to go one step further 
then you want them asking, what the hell am I lying to myself about? That's, that's the level at which you get them, right? Mm -hmm. and, and for me, in this history, one of the most powerful things to do coming out of, out of the Freedom Summer discussions, right, is, is to ask them, are you, to begin a class, to walk in, you know, no, 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 no preamble, uh, and ask them, do you think you're better than, than, than a member of the Ku Klux Klan? Heavy silence. <laughs> they don't know what they, they're jump on. They don't know what I'm doing, <laughs> and they're not going to walk into a trap. But then that conversation, right, gets really rich once they get over that kind of. Because of course they they do, and they know they should not, right. And so in that space, right, that discomfort, right, it's how are you constructing this? What would you, Bob Moses? Uh, I'll see if I can find the link in terms of Jeff Will gave a speech at Berkeley in 1965, a group of liberal white students who were Berkeley, 1965, need I say more, <laughs> who were looking down at all the racists in the South. And Bob says, you know, you ain't that different from them. You're not that different from them, right? Mm -hmm. And if, if you can un learn to understand to not use white racists in the South as a lightning rod, but to use it as a mirror, then you can understand Vietnam, right? Then you can understand what's going on in, in, in South America. But if all you do is emphasize how different you are, you never get there. Right? So that notion of what would it take for you to do the kind of things that you see clans people doing in the 1960s, right? The whole notion, which for me, I have to use this phrase, goes back into the discussion of African American humanism, right? Mm. It's this notion of, of, of Mrs. Hayden after she's been, I'm sorry, with Anna Palmer, when she was beaten along with Mrs. Hayden, saying the men who beat me are alienated from God. She didn't say that they were inferior or different or, or whatever, right? But that they are not fundamentally different from me. Right? Um, but, 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 but I'm trying to just envision a, a, a pedagogy in which we get kids to question their innermost assumptions, and again, as much as possible, without, without feeling assaulted by, by, by the teachers. And to go back to this notion of, in, in other contexts, how do you get kids open up the kind of work Derek is doing, I know, for, for a long time. This issue of getting them to think about issues of gender. And I'm not different. It's, it's hard for me to critique issues of gender. Right? That is so much a part of our primary socialization. Um, that if you can get kids to think about gender, you can get them to think about anything else. I, I, I really have come to believe that. Right? Uh, and that in terms of working with kids who are doing, who, who are coming out of tough neighborhoods in Chicago, it's really very difficult to get them to the point in which you call women B. Why do you do that? Where is that coming from? Right? Your conception of a man is, is this. Is that the only way to think about what a man can be? And where did that way come from? Who profits from that? If, if you want to see a curriculum that's about this, uh, there's a group called Brotherhood Sister Soul in New York that does this work, and I think it's now online, the, the Education for Liberation Curriculum, and I, 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 those are titles of some of the lessons they do, their approach to teaching about gender, and, and, and not to plug my book, but in my book, Teach Freedom, one of their staff members, Susan Wilcox, has an essay in which she talks about what kids are getting out of these lessons on gender, right? Uh, I think I can send that to the But But what I'm saying is that if we can get them to think at that level, Right. If we can, it, it's a step in, in the direction of them becoming more socially critical. And that for me right now is, is, is one of my, if they can analyze <coughs> the way in which they are themselves individually reacting to social forces around them, it is liberating. Uh, and that's at least for me right now part of it. That's your why I'm so interested in the freedom school as a model. Because that's a context in which we can do that. Uh, all right, all right, now I'll look back at you. Now I'll look back at you. All right. okay. well, let's get
I know you have all these books, so you probably want to go drop them off, which is why I fought with Keith and gave you to 1.30 uh, instead of the 1 o'clock or 1.15 so you don't have to haul that stuff with you. Um, you can grab lunch downstairs, you can grab it in the cafeteria, you can grab it in your dorm room, the leftovers from last night, whatever. But we'll see you at 1.30 in front, and we're leaving at 1.30 to go to the Sonic Temple in front building. of, right in front this of building. this building. Oh, I don't yeah. have classes, right in front of the door when we come in, where you're right there.